welcome back to session four of the state of the school. We're going to be covering distance learning, our distance learning handbook, what that looks like during phases one through three in our period of Thanksgiving to Christmas break. So as you'll see up on the screen here, this is the My Safe Start plan. Uh, not only does it cover phases one through three, but it covers four through six. Right now we are in phase four, hopefully moving to phase five uh, based on the data that we do have for our area. So we can hope and pray that that's where we're headed. However, as we travel into the fall and later winter months, uh, there could be a possibility that we may slide backwards into phases one through three. If and when this does happen um, per executive order, order, we would have to close our building and move into a period of virtual learning. So I just want to make sure that all parents are aware of that in phases four through six, our doors will be open and we will be meeting the needs of our students uh, in person. If we are in phases one through three, our doors will be closed, but we'll be meeting the needs of those students in uh, our virtual learning space. So uh, I've gotten a couple questions, Mrs. Kresge. Uh, virtual learning, November 30th to December 18th. Michigan State, you know, has chosen not to come back. Why, why are we still doing this? And that's a great question, one that does need to be asked. So hopefully this helps clarify that for our families. Many of us have not been in contact with our greater or extended family during this time of COVID. Uh, and because we haven't, we've been able to stay safe uh, in our own little bubbles uh, with those people that we've let in. However, we know as we come to Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's going to be a time when when families are finally getting back together for the first time. They're going to be traveling and they're going to be seeing each other. It is highly likely that during these interactions with families that a child or a family will come home and find out that they had been around someone who had COVID. They may not have known it at the time or another illness that may close us down. Uh, so because it is so highly probable this is going to happen, it is easier for us to help our families prepare ahead of time for virtual learning for those three weeks than to have us come back into session, find out that someone had COVID and then expose students at St. Thomas and to then close down for two weeks uh, and then we'll be closed up until we start in January 4th of the next year. So, uh, and again, this was not only following that recommendation of Michigan State, which those students who actually did come back to Michigan State and are on campus will also be returning home still from November 30th until they come back in January. Uh, but this was also something that we talked and debated about um, in our safety committee. And is, is this something that we should be doing our, for our families, knowing that it's a three week period, the amount of travel that happens at St. Thomas and the statistical likeliness that someone is going to be exposed to COVID during that time. Again, this is not because it was purposeful, but it is that someone has contracted COVID, but it is likely that it's going to happen because we have not been in contact with that many people, um, or we shouldn't have been in contact if we've been staying in our own bubbles. So this is to help protect everybody at St. Thomas and to know that we can, during those three weeks, really meet the educational needs of our students while supporting the health of our community. So that is the big reason why we are still continuing with those three weeks of online learning from Thanksgiving to Christmas. If you do have any more questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to talk to you on the phone um, and that would probably be the best way to do it. You're welcome to email me and we can set up a time, but I'd love just to talk to you on the phone if you do have any questions. As we do move into that period of three weeks and if we happen to move into another period of virtual learning because we've moved into phases three through one, you will need to refer to our distance learning handbook. This is linked within the return to school plan in section seven under instruction. I believe it's a bullet point number two, uh, but it will talk about the distance learning plan. In the distance learning plan, it's gonna lay out all the information that you most likely have questions on. So what will my student be doing? Will this look like it did last year? Um, how how long will my student need to be online? Are you going to have plans like the public schools currently have? So this document will help share with you all of those expectations that we have heading into that virtual learning period. 
So the first thing I want to highlight out of our distance learning plan is communication. Communication is going to be extremely important during any period of virtual learning. This year, uh, by 5 p.m. on Sunday evening prior to the week of virtual learning, you will receive a layout of the week from your child's teacher. That plan is going to tell you everything that your child's going to be working on throughout their day from language arts, religion, math, social studies, science, um, and then again we will have that enrichment component as well for our specials. But that will be given to you by 5 p.m. the Sunday prior to the week so that you can help plan for the week ahead. Uh, we know that you also will be working from home and you'll need that plan uh, so that you can get started or that you may have several students that you need to plan for. So that's a change that we're making this year to make sure that you have that prior to the week starting. By 9 a.m., your assignments will be posted in Google or Google Classroom for your students. So although you're gonna receive that plan on Sunday night, they won't be released until 9 a.m. that morning for students to get started. Um, and so you're gonna to need to look in the Seesaw or Google Classroom for your student. Um, you will also continue to receive communication throughout the week outside of that uh, Friday, or excuse me, Sunday night update. So look for those coming from your teachers as well. There's also the communication tools that we uh, hope that you will continue to bookmark and follow through the eLearning Hub and the tools that your students will use. The next big piece is the amount of time of e-learning. So when we look at the amount of time that a student is going to be working throughout the day, we had to look at what is best practice. Is it really best practice for a child to sit in front of a computer from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m.? No, no adult wants to sit in front of a computer between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. all day. So what we've broken down is what is best practice for learning expectations for a student. So you'll see on the slide that the expectations are that if you're in preschool that you'll have 60 minutes a day. Kindergarten, you'll have about 90 minutes or one and a half hours of work. Uh, grades two through three, you're having 120 minutes or two hours a day. Grades four and five, 150 minutes or two and a half hours a day. And then uh, sixth grade, up to three hours, and seventh and eighth, 45 minutes per subject or up to three hours per day. This is outside the learning time that you're going to have for Zooms. Zooms this year are going to be uh, also scheduled, and you're going to be meeting with your teacher, at least in the older grades, once per subject per grade. So for instance, if you're in fourth grade, you're going to have to meet for religion on one day, the next day you'll meet on mathematics possibly. Then on Wednesday you might meet on language arts. Thursday you might meet on social studies. And Friday you might meet on science. So you will have a session with your teacher based on those areas of learning. However, your teacher may also decide instead of just doing that one uh, 30 minute period for language arts, maybe they're still differentiating into their small groups that they had in their classroom. And they may have different times in which they're gonna meet with you for those 30 minutes in smaller groups of students. Uh, last year, our uh, fourth grade teachers, uh, Mrs. Montgomery and Mrs. Royal did this very successfully. I know that our fifth grade teachers uh, did this as well and so did our sixth grade uh, teachers. Uh, Mrs. Gradwall did an amazing job uh, with mathematics. So do look for that communication and that layout to come when students will be on those Zoom sessions. But the time that they're working outside of Zoom um, has been labeled there. So I've also included in the uh, distance learning plan kind of a way to schedule out your day. It's a sample plan of what a day should look like right? Your child at St. Thomas comes in, we have morning work, then they might move into mathematics for their 90 minute block. Then they're going to take a break, okay? 90 minutes is a long time for kiddos. They also might have a special after that, so have a special at home. The enrichment page is still there. You can have art, you can have music, technology, everything's going to be there for you. Then your student may come back and work on that language arts period. Then we have, again, religion, we have social studies, we have science. So it's meeting all of those within a plan um, that fits though for your family. So student expectations. Uh, this is again going to look different for K3 than it does for 8. If you have a student in K through 3, as you can see on this slide, uh, students and parents must log into school on Monday, Wednesday, Friday via Seesaw and upload any assignments that are due um, by the established due date of the teacher. Um, students will need to actively participate and follow expectations, whether that's in Zoom or on Seesaw. And then students need to uh, make sure that they are on that Zoom session, which there will only be one a week uh, for a minimum of 20 minutes. However, However, again, look to your teacher because they may be looking at doing more differentiated groups in reading and mathematics. In fourth through eighth grade, the expectations are going to be a little bit more rigorous. 
So again, you're looking for your student to log into that Google Classroom Monday through Friday. They will have assignments that will be released, so they're going to want to look at that. Um, students do need to actively participate and follow the teacher's expectations, and this does include religion. Students need to actively respond to communication, and when they are on Zoom, uh, that will be how they gain credit for not only their class, but attendance as well. Their screen does need to be on, and they do need to follow that, those Zoom expectations for our students. Access to technology. Mrs. Kruski, we don't have enough technology at home to do this. That's okay. We're here to partner with you and to make sure that your students have what they need to get through that period of learning. Uh, here you're going to see that we have a device checkout uh, Google form. So if it's something that your family does need, please dive into that distance learning plan, fill out that Google form, and make sure to get in contact with me uh, via email or by phone so that I can make sure that when we come to that time that I'm able to supply those resources for your family. Another big piece of virtual online learning, our students are exposed to the World Wide Web and we need to focus on the digital citizenship and etiquette. So in the document, uh, and I know that our students, at least in the older grades, have already gone over on our e-learning hub, what that e-learning pledge is, again, what their online expectations are, uh, as well as a digital um, citizen rubric and how to follow that. Some other tips that might be good for your family are be with your child when they're doing this. I know we can't always be right next to them when they're working, but you can check in on them, making sure that they are working and uh, following the guidelines that they need for online learning. All devices should be used in a public area of your home. I wouldn't suggest that uh, you allow students to head into those room and close those doors as unless you have a uh, neat device or a program on your computer uh, like Covenant Eyes that can tell you what's happening on that computer, um, I would recommend that you stay in, in a public area where your children know that you may be watching them. Check and see the history. Uh, what has your child gotten into? Sometimes we just trust our kiddos to do things on their iPads or on their phones, and we as parents just don't take the time to check their history. But checking that history is important and will tell you if there is something extra going on that you may need to you know, dive a little deeper into and talk to your student about. Note that if you are borrowing a school device, it is for learning purposes only. We will be checking history of school devices um, and we need to make sure that those are being respected and used appropriately. Um, last but not least, I think the biggest thing that we can do as parents for our children is make sure that each night when we head to bed that those devices are turned into parents, whether they are charging in your own bedroom or they're charging in a common area of the house. But it is when our students or when we allow our children to take those devices into their rooms at night that I can share that we see a lot of things happen. Um, and then unfortunately that does follow them to school. Uh, so that is just one good way that as a parent that you can step in and help make sure that your child is being safe and healthy as they are using their online tools. So that closes out our virtual learning. Why we'll be doing that period of virtual learning, what it looks like if we move into phases one through three. And next session will be for our middle school students and parents. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.